slide here, but the slide would generally be something that looks like, you know, the purpose of copyright is to reward financially the authors and creators of a work, you know, A. B is to, what, what else could we say? Um, so to say, give a unique monopoly for as long as possible to exclude others from being able to copy something. Um, C, to promote the progress of science and useful arts, and D, um, like because we, effort. yeah, to reward effort that, that people put into creating things. And I, I, of course I didn't give a perfect breakdown of that, but I don't know what people have in mind as to, what, what, do you, what first comes to mind when you think of the purpose of copyright? Is it to, to reward financially? Is it to reward effort? Is it to? I think protection. Prote yeah. Protection. Protect ideas. So to, pre to protect ideas. And the idea being so, so that somebody else can't copy it and get credit for it. Any other thoughts on, or what first comes to mind? Well, most people who respond to it get it dead wrong. And even lawyers get it wrong. Like copyright lawyers get it wrong. And the purpose of copyright is written out inside of the Constitution, <laughs> which is stated right there. That to promote the progress in, of science and the useful arts by securing for a limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. It doesn't say anything about to make, to let the copyright holder make as much money <coughs> as possible or to protect people from, you know, stealing your ideas. Of course, there's that concept of a limited monopoly, which is the idea to prevent people from, you know, from taking what you've created um, or at least captured through expression and, and, and to blindly making distributions of it. But the purpose is to you know, make the, to make people share things. It's not to restrict. Um, and there's, there's a variety of other people who can elegantly talk about this. And this is sort of a very spontaneous sort of conversation about it. But I think if there's anything that we can help teach you guys, it's this idea that copyright's actually pretty interesting <laughs> and, and, and is, is, is meant to simply provide people with incentives to create, but not to restrict people. Sharing and using and and, uh, and building upon other people's works. Um, there is this common notion, though, that that uh, right here. So, like the sweat and brow rationale that oftentimes comes alongside this idea of why one would get potentially get copyright. And it's it's interesting, but it's wrong, right? So, there's a classic uh, court case, uh, in, in it's 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 Feist versus. Is it on the next slide? Uh, this, is your, this is Bryce Pills' lecture, by the way. Vice versus Royal. Is it? Okay. Yeah, um, rural. Where the person created a phone book, right? They were like, okay, we're going to take all, of course, we all know the concept of a phone book. And then somebody else created another phone book that pretty much did the same thing that that first person did. And what the court decided to say was that there's not protection for the amount of effort that one uses to create their work. It's for the expression. Or the, what, you, what, is, what is basically protected is how one decides to express that work. So an ordered list of names and phone numbers doesn't merit enough creative expression to merit copyright. So we've been, we've been talking about some of the objects which will come across inside of our lectures that follow a similar sort of rationale that, that lies in this. So data. Right, this is one of those primary concepts that we can talk a little bit about. Data can't be copyrighted, right? right? It's a collection of facts, it's a collection of something that somebody went and gathered. Um, when you take that data and put it into something, like a, a graphing software, such as Excel or something like that, you're gonna come out with a graph. And that graph might be on an X and Y axis. It has you know, a distribution curve of some sort. The, the, what's being talked about there is that idea that if I had the data, somebody else has that same data, and we used a similar software, maybe not the same one, or even just did it on the blackboard, um, what we're going to come out with is, is, is something that looks very much the same. There's no, there's no creative expression in creating that graph. Um, now, that's not to say that somebody couldn't spend some extra time figuring out how to make that graph expressive, but that's going to that's gonna be something a little bit different. That's not simply adding colors and maybe a dimension to it, because that's, I mean, I mean, that might, that might 
in some in some arguments make make sense, but it's taking that data and coming up with a very new way of expressing it. Most people would create a graph, but Chris, because he loves dance, will decide to record a video and show how the you know these two elements of data combine and and, and, and he's dancing about it. That's a, that's the expression that would be be considered, you know, protectable. So yeah, I, I, I want to touch on one thing that you're sort of pointing out. Um, this, the, the action verb is really important here. So Darren initially said something about data and how people gather data, right? They gather a collection of data. That is, that kind of work uh, th does not have some sort of copyright protection. When you, when you move into this idea of creating something, uh, that's what then would merit uh, some sort of copyright protection. So you, you were saying, create graphs, but I think what you actually meant to say was generate a graph. Sure, sure. So I can use an algorithm in some software to generate a graph, right? I'm not creating anything, right? I'm not, I'm not actually using my, right. I'm not making creative choices to, to, to build a graph, right? I'm just generating it through software. So that kind of thing, again, is not protected by copyright. But when you start, when, when people start um, drawing out graphs and, and, and making Serious, com uh, uh, I, I guess, yeah, creative, expressive, right. creatively expressive uh, decisions about those graphs. That's when you get copyright protection. Right. So again, yeah, the, those sort of action words are really important. Here. Right. And so, I mean, here's an interesting kind of uh, quote that helps, I think, really nail this point. It may seem unfair that much of the fruit of the compiler's label of labor may be used by others without compensation. And as Justice Brennan has correctly observed, however, this is not some unforeseen byproduct of a statutory scheme. It is rather the essence of copyright and a constitutional requirement. The primary objective of copyright is not to reward the labor of authors, but to promote the proper science of the laws, right? So to this end, copyright assures authors the right to their original expression, but encourages others to build freely upon the ideas and information. do want to jump to is um, sort of the, that idea of the exceptions to um, uh, copyright. Or I wouldn't say exceptions. It's sort of like additional cool things we should know about uh, called fair use. <laughs> like, um, so actually, maybe we can run through this. Actually, what copyright covers? So original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium. And as we're knowing, this can be just about anything. You have an idea, and you write it down on a piece of paper. And, and you convey it in your own original thought and, and words, like you now have copyright over the, the way in which somebody decides to, or a way that you can distribute, re, you know, tell other people how to reuse it, distribute it. Um, you can even draw a, a smiley face of sorts and add, you know, add some hair and other things. Like if nobody else has really done that before, in the, you know, that you, that's your own unique expression. Um, and so this this obviously spans literary, traumatic, musical, visual works, architecture, and other kinds of works that probably aren't listed here. So, um, there's questions around what else is covered by copyright, right? Is source code that makes up a web page, or uh, even the, the way in which a program operates is covered by copyright? And these are, these, these were many, I remember in, in at least Jack Bernard's class having long discussions about this. Um, so I'm not gonna try and say yes or no to it now, but just know that there is there is a there is a debate about whether source code can be copyrighted because it's it's basically functional, right? Uh, and algorithmic a lot of times. But I think there are many cases where it's shown that it can be. Um, so the rights, right? So what the, a copyright holder has is the right to tell others you can't reproduce this or how they can reproduce it. Better better put that way. Um, you can give somebody else permission to reproduce something, uh, but that's your right as a copyright holder. So you also are allowed to tell people how they work and if they can make derivative works of that work. Um, you, you, again, you, you as a copyright holder uh, control distribution of that work, where you want it to appear, how you want it to appear, uh, whether or not people can perform that work publicly and, and, and basically re repeat verbatim what you have, uh, have a copyright over. Um, and then obviously, 
obviously to display publicly that work. But, so, the thing about that is that that's all covered by, there are exceptions to all of these things. So. Limitations. Sorry, exactly, I hesitate to use the word exceptions, and he's got it here, but I like the word limitations, because exception sounds like, ah, uh, you know, they made this idea that everybody has, you know, these rights, but then we made these exceptions over here for, for other uses. But the way that it's really written is there are these rights, but the copyright holder has limitations on enforcing those rights. So, because we have things called fair use. So you, you can do about just about everything that you want as a copyright holder, but the following, but the following things that are covered under fair use. So, he, uh, I'm not sure what he gets through here. Okay, here's, here's a good thing to, to point out. What's not covered by copyright? So you had said ideas, to protect ideas or protect, that's one of the things that we, you can never copyright. So I have an idea about something, like who knows who else has that idea? Like you can, the only thing that you can copyright in that idea is how you write it down, how you express it, how you get it out into the, into a tangible medium. But you can't prevent me from thinking that idea. You can't say, hey, I had that idea and it's mine, and you can't think that. Um, if we did that, we wouldn't be promoting learning. One of the one of the things covered by copyright that's not covered by copyright is ideas. Again, the, the rights to perform privately. We've all probably sung to ourselves in the shower. Uh, however, we didn't have to go ask any number of, of our favorite artists for permission to do that. That's one of the things that's granted to us by the Constitution is that you can repeat, perform, uh, and do these sort of things pri uh, in private. Um, use of a specific work after the first sale. So. This is something called the first sale doctrine. The idea you buy a book uh, from the library or you know from the bookstore. Uh, copyright allows you to decide what you want to do with that, whether or not you want to resell it or redistribute it in some fashion. That individual work. So it's not you can't simply copy it and make thousands of copies, but you can choose what you want to do with that particular work. Um, and so that's that's a really important part of, of of the copyright law because it again allows people to to share works in a way that will promote. Hey, I love this book. Uh, read it or, or buy it from you. And if you couldn't do that, then you'd obviously be squashing uh, that idea of learning and the progress of science and useful arts. Ideas, we mentioned facts, this sort of stuff. You can't copyright the fact that something is a fact, right? So, you know, these are the dimensions of this door. Uh, you know, this is the, the sort of the, the 50 states and their capitals. Uh, you know, these, all of these things are, are meant to be, I mean, facts is the idea of you share facts, people build off of facts, which is a similar concept of data, right? We, ga we gathered this information, and now we, we can generate any number of interpretations that, from that data and from these facts, and that's what would be protected by copyright. But the fundamental um, component of this being the facts of the data can't be copyrighted. So we're, there's, there's kind of interesting bu buttons that we want to make right now after a meeting with science commons that say like, your data is our data, <laughs> or you know, like, I mean, your facts are our facts. And the idea that, you know, making sure that people understand the concept that like, that in that sense, information is, is truly free. Um, and functional elements, I'm, I'm not sure what he would have been describing here, but um, well, uh, the door is 10 inches wide. And, and I think that this applies to like code, like the source code that you were talking uh, about. Yeah, so exactly. So HTML tags, for instance, are functional uh, elements. There you go. So here he has on this side, what section 106 of the um, copyright law would, would talk about would be the rights that the copyright holder has. Um, there's these non-copyrightable uh, aspects of, uh, of what we've talked about. And then in, in between here are these limitations, as you can see, on the copyright holder. Not exceptions to, but limitations on. So look at how many sections there are there. Yeah, I, I don't like the way that this is drawn at all. I think that... I mean, you, you have like this little thing, right? 106, right yeah. here, it's a, a little circle. And then you've got around it, fair use, right? All these other sections of, of the, the um, what's your phone? Yeah. It's the big book of code, no, US code. US code, yeah. And then you've got that over, kind of surrounding, and then kind of around that, you have these facts and ideas. Yeah, that's true. And it's sort of like these concentric circles, but the really small circle is copyright. 
and everything around it limits how big copyright can get there. Yeah, but is, and I think the thing though is that copyright's not evil, it's awesome. Like, it's, it truly is an amazing thing that allows for a lot of innovation, a lot of, um, uh, again, that, that idea of you know, preventing people for a short period of time from copying is that you can actually perhaps make um, a, a living off of it or perhaps just you know, do whatever. I think what happens, why it's, it, it, it inflates itself is because big publishers and, and people who do end up making a lot of money or like becoming very successful off of uh, some of the creative works that they've created inflate the importance of it. So, uh, but again, I think as much as it's as much as, as much as we want to emphasize that there are these all alternative limitations, that copyright in its essence is, is a pretty cool and useful thing. All right, so how long does it last, right? So for individual copyright lasts, the life of one's author, or the life of that author plus 70 years. So Jack Bernard has, does this great sort of, um, you know, guess how long this thing I just created won't be available, <laughs> which is to say, it's not in his his lifetime. It won't be available in his daughter's lifetime. And it probably won't even be available in, what is it, half of the other daughter's lifetime? It may, it may even go another it generation. Was like, it was like seven generations, do, I think. I think it was four generations. But it copyright as it stands now affects four generations of people in reusing. And so uh, Lawrence Lessig and other, other individuals like Jamie Boyle, who just wrote a book called Public Domain, talk about this in the sense of like, this is pretty much locking down 21st century culture, 20th century culture. Like the, the idea that most of what people have created is now un, you know, not accessible to people living to, to use and reuse in, in ways that make sense it, it is kind of may, might be an issue because we live in an era of, of digital media and we live in a culture that bases itself perhaps on that idea of building and sharing. So a lot of great texts that uh, I would encourage you guys to read for sure. The idea um, works for hire. This is where it gets really crazy. 120 years after creation, or 95 years after the publication, and so whichever is shorter there. But this this applies to sort of works that you know corporate uh, entities would create. Um, so it's, I mean, and that's I I, I don't, I don't want to nag on it too much, but that's I feel like, and a lot of people will make the argument, a lot of what copyright legislation focuses on is really protecting the rights of a very few number of individuals and, and, and institutions. And really doesn't do that much of a of a, a service, perhaps, to individuals. Um, but that's why we have things like the Creative Commons and uh, other institutions that have sort of stepped in to say, "Hey, this is what does make sense for people and individuals in terms of limiting the length of time." I don't I don't want to get too deep into the history, but pr prior to 1976, you had to put a copyright symbol on your material, and so you'll oftentimes hear a faculty member saying, "You know, perhaps we're in the period of time of publishing stuff." prior to 1976, so, oh, do I have to put a copyright a, a symbol on it to make it official? And since 1976, what changed in the, in the legislation of the Copyright Act was to say that once somebody puts something down in a tangible medium expression, they, they hold the copyright to that. No longer do they need to put a copyright symbol on it, nor do they need to renew it every X amount of years to make it valid. It's just set in stone that, you know, life of the author plus seven. And that was actually part of the, and there's other legislation on top of that called the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act, where uh, Sonny Bono, the legislator, was doing a, perhaps a, a, a favor of the, the Disney Corporation <laughs> in helping extend copyright uh, for much longer than perhaps necessary. Um, I do want to talk about fair use, because this is something that we're pretty, we're pretty excited about, um, and we'll sort of I don't know the game that Bryce plays, but maybe we can play this at some other point in time. Um, what we want to talk about are the limitations uh, on copyright. And what fair use measures, and I don't know if this is big enough. Um, first of all, it's, it's to say nobody can determine a fair use. So we've been talking about, oh, we'll probably use that under a fair use. It's still an argument. It's not the only person that can really tell us whether or not it is an actual fair use judge who, who would sit before and say, you know, based on his understanding of common law and, and, and whatnot, like, this is what he could make a more, uh, he could make the authoritative determination of whether or not one use was fair or not. And in that, there's not really, like, prescriptive 
um, if you follow these steps, you'll have a clear fair use. There's nothing that says, you know, if it has this dimensions or has these characteristics or whatever, then yes, absolutely, it's, it's fair. And it's a good thing that we don't have that because we can make a number of great arguments as to why we can use something uh, because there aren't really prescriptive uh, and drawn out. Um, it, there's nothing drawn out about it. So the concept of fair use, though, is probably something that we're oftentimes most familiar with inside of the classroom. So faculty members are using all of this material inside of their course materials as, as we're going through their classes. And you see pictures that appear from any number of institutions, any number of copyright holders. Fair use is sort of, it fits into that, but it's not, what, what, what faculty members are doing isn't written out in law as like, you can do this. It's sort of an agreement between publishers and educational institutions, that idea of, of, how, you know, of educational fair use. And that's a whole other topic that we can get into. But the purpose of, 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 of fair use in general is to allow, again, people to make limited uses of, of other people's works for the purpose of commentary, criticism, um, and, and, and basically, again, building on that idea of advancing knowledge and, 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 and promoting learning. So, again, so then I could write like an article uh, on uh, my commentary around a website or my commentary around a book and include lines out of that book or lines from that website. That's a very standard fair use that we use in everyday practice, right? That could move up the reign of, hey, there's this photo that was taken of this rally uh, where this person was doing this and if we compare it to this photo that appeared in this other uh, similar context of, of the 1969 peace rally, you know, there, there's comparisons and commentaries that are being made where you, you as the person writing that article doesn't, you don't need necessarily to ask the permission of the person who took that photo use it and publish it and distribute it. Or in other words, in sort of, if, if, this isn't the terminology, but infringe on the copyright holder's exclusive rights. So you're entitled to do that because, again, what we want to do is promote the, this, uh, promote learning. But what, what judges consider when they are looking at whether or not, whether or not a use is considered fair are these four factors. And you'll, you'll hear some of these be tossed around as we go through stuff. And, f and the four factors are purpose and character of your use, the nature of the copyrighted work itself, the amount and substantiality of the portion that you do decide to use, and then the effect upon the use of, of that potential market for that particular object. One of the most, I think the most heavily weighed upon one is factor four. Um, oftentimes you'll see, you know, how much did your use of this prevent somebody else from going to, to buy that object or use that object? Um, the amount, we see this oftentimes, the, the, the amount is like, a good example of this is sort of the, uh, the thumbnail cases that we see when we do a Google image search. You know, there, there's a scaled down version of that larger resolution image that's on uh, a Google image search return result uh, page. And that there is, is sort of a fair use. It's saying here's this, it's a very small amount, a small portion taken. The nature of the copyrighted work oftentimes does a better job of describing this than I do. Whether it's factual, whether it's creative in and of itself. So are you taking are you taking information that was, in the case of David's work, we see a, a, a dictionary definition and, and creating and de redistributing it, or are you taking a poem <coughs> and redistributing it? So that might have a different effect on whether or not the, um, the nature is there. And then the purpose and character of your use, is it for commentary and criticism? Or are you adding new knowledge to it? Are you in some way transforming somebody's or that work in general by adding new understanding around that? Um, and that's something that's actually one of the more important things is sort of how you end up using the work. If you simply say, I liked this picture, and you put it on your website now with, I liked this picture, you have a less you have less of, a, of an argument around a fair use uh, claim than if you said, I did you know I liked this picture and here's why you know and, and, and provided much more of a, of a explanation, perhaps putting it in a chronology of, I like all these pictures and here's why. Um, uh, so that you're pro providing somebody at the end with a new understanding of why this work is important. So, oh, uh, yes, educational fair use here. Is there anything you want to add to that? In terms of educational or, or no, or or in general, or take away? <coughs> no, I, I think that's, it, it, yeah, it's just, it's really difficult. Yeah. Um, but I think the more you guys can understand 
that there are those four factors and yeah. and just be thinking about it. Yeah. I mean, are there questions that come up around it as, as in terms of what, what does that make sense as to sort of again the, the, the purpose of copyright and the fact that there are these limitations on, on one's ability to restrict people's access? I think silence as a nod of agreement. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. Saying sort of widespread distribution. Yeah. Um, so the educate educational fair use, which is sort of separate from general fair use, uh, has you know so a, a few different um, I don't know sort of components to it. One being when it's locked down inside the classroom or a virtual classroom, right? Like C tools is sort of a virtual classroom. Um, when it's when it's locked down within within there, you have uh, a few extra rights uh, or, or or sort of more liberal fair uses that you can make um, by us sort of opening it up to the public and distributing it widely. We're now falling under the, the more general fair use conditions, um, and those aren't. I, I don't want to say they're not as liberal, but they can be more difficult to defend or, or to to argue for. Have, have there been any distribution, have there been any legal sort of precedent set over this widespread open education initiative? No, not, not in, in terms of somebody challenging someone's use of something, not yet. So no one's really making fair uses uh, explicitly um, in, in the realm of OER. Notre Dame, I think, has published one image, and it was a, a Rolling Stone cover of Kanye West, uh, sort of posed as, as Jesus Christ, and they did, you know, there's like commentary about that, etc. Uh, and so that you know they were able to make a fair use claim, uh, but but they actually, I don't think that they they outlined that fair use claim. Uh, I should say that on Wikimedia Commons. You can find images where people have said, "Okay, here's here's my fair use justification," and they actually write it out, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, that's a model that we're not going to use right now uh, because we think that that actually limits our ability to defend it in a court case. Um, but those explanations follow basically these four rationale. Exactly. You know, this is a very limited amount. It's a factual work. It's you know, it's scaled down. Content that we are going to publish under fair use, you'll just see a source tag with it, right? Um, which doesn't necessarily help the end user too much. Sort of understand that you know we're using it in this context, and that makes it a fair use. Uh, but right now, we're not really sure how to educate the end user on that. Fair
high quality clips that they want to put in there to show this is what the civil rights movement looked like according to this this individual. Do I actually need to grab permission and pay ten thousand dollars? Or are the happy birthday song is a good example of people paying ten thousand and some dollars every time that appears in a, in a film. Um, so if, if you know if you have if you're shooting happy birthday and it appears in a film, you know, is it a fair use or, or how you know, how do you make those different arguments? The context for us is gonna be a bit different and challenging because of the variety of different content objects we come across and then the quantity that we also come across. But I think the goal is to again work with the, a variety of OCW institutions and then some of these individuals at the American University to follow some of the same footsteps that they had in place in creating those other guidebooks so that then we can make more informed uh, recommendations about what to do and then in terms of when you come across content, content and then have a better basis for defending actions if we are in a scenario where we do find somebody challenging us with us. Let's, let's jump back to um, editing stuff, unless there are other questions. I know that people had some questions today about how do we get going with editing materials that we have, or that have been cleared. Oh, and did you mention that this, these lecture slides are all a part of Rice Oh, yeah. All of the lecture slides here, if you're interested, are part of Rice Pools' um, intellectual property and information law course. Kathleen was in last semester at Eastgrad, and they're all um, access, you know, you can access them via our Educommons site. So if you want to try and inform yourself as much as possible about <laughs> copyright you can, and patent and other IP stuff, you can do it there. All right, so some of you are probably in the stage of, I've, you know, you've uploaded the materials to the, to the, to the tool, you've, you've assigned an action, you've cleared it, and now the next logical step will be to edit the materials go to the describe task list, most of, if not all, of the instructions you'll need to know uh, are sitting inside of that. So it's six on the task list. The first thing we're going to be thinking about adding here is the metadata that needs to be associated with the um, images inside of Orca. So there's a um, instructions uh, sheet here as to sort of what, what sort of metadata should be sitting next to um, certain objects, just making sure you have filled out correct information in each set of those tabs. So if you, you know, mark something as remove and annotate, make sure that you've um, got the content type and citation put in there because that, you know, we're going to need to put in that citation when we say this image has been removed, you can potentially find it there. If there is no citation, there is no citation. <laughs> in which case, we'll just say the image has been removed. But do your best to sort of fill out as much as you can inside of Orca uh, that information as you're clearing so that then when we are editing, it's uh, a lot easier to, to put that information in. Next then would be the editing guidelines. So what we're going to do is we, gotta, we have to basically confirm that everything's ready to go. You know, you, you've cleared the materials, you've talked to who you need to talk to about what to do with them, and then basically follow the steps that are outlined in the editing guidelines. Um, what we're doing mainly is taking a PowerPoint that we've created that has all the necessary editing um, sort of templates, and then copying and pasting those where need be. So basically we call it, we call it the first thing the sort of title page disclaimer content object source information um, template. And if you download this, what you're going to get is the, um, the basically the title slide that appears in the front of every content on every con or learning object that we deal with. That's a PowerPoint or a syllabus or anything. And this then goes into the front of the slide as you can see, yeah, I'll go back to Bryce's lecture. Basically goes into the front of the slide here. Um, and what this has in it is obviously the, the license that the faculty member's chosen, the link to that license, the year of the copyright and who holds the copyright. Has a uh, disclaimer basically telling people that they shouldn't diagnose themselves medically um, and yet use this as medical advice. Um, but of course other stuff saying that it includes copyrighted material. Um, and then the button for which since that faculty member's chosen. So you're going you're gonna to find everything that you need to add into a, lect into a lecture inside of this PowerPoint. So that's basically, that's under step one then in the wiki. And then these instructions will just tell you how to deal with each one of those materials in terms of adding in the necessary materials. Uh, uh, 
components of in the slide. So you've got for PowerPoint presentations what what you need to do there, and then uh, how to actually remove and annotate an object. Um, questions about whether when you come across public domain images, there are things that that have been marked as retained permission, what to put there. So if, if anything isn't clear inside of that, do do let us know. But um, or if you want to work to, through it together, um, we can definitely we can definitely do that. So it, this 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 step can be a bit time consuming. I'll, I'll make sure that people know that. But I'll encourage you to sort of create like create one master template for your lecture material. So if you know your I mean make no, slide number three in here your faculty member's name. You know some of that might change with regard to the contributors that that, that, that uh, you might share copyright in that as, as you go throughout the semester. Um, you know you can potentially you can create you can create a template of um, sort of images remove things so that you can actually just drag and drop that in a lot quicker. So if you create a folder on your on your desktop or in your OER folder or wherever where you can just draw from, it's going to go a lot quicker as you go along. Um, but mainly, I just want to point that out because I know that I know that uh, David has been obviously editing materials in Madison. You're on you're on the way to do it, so um, it's all pretty straightforward. Questions about that or any other stuff? I will say that we're going to try and make a lot of this a lot easier as the process goes on. Like we want to have a feature in the tool that will allow you to basically export all that metadata, so you don't have to go back and capture it. it might be a text file that would just come out and it basically say like on slide one you're going to be putting this information, slide two this information, and then slide five that, and that's all. That would all be based on your. Yeah, and kind of speaking yeah. slightly to that, kind of tangential, I think you all received an email from Jacob Solomon oh, yeah. a couple days ago about uh, just a quick survey that he's doing. So he uh, he's an SI student, and he does usability work for us for Orca. And so if you guys could just take five minutes and, and do a survey, that'd be really helpful. It'd help us give feedback on the actual software, and then we'll 